since a shocking photo on the cover of the New York Times exposed an alleged secret society. Women say they were branded, referred to as sex slaves, and forced to give collateral to guarantee their silence. They say they were all members of Nexium, which began as a self-help group. This is the group Catherine Oxenberg has been speaking out about, that her daughter India was involved in. And its leader is a man named Keith Ranieri. He is currently in federal prison, facing numerous charges that he's pleaded not guilty in response to. And our next guest was an active member of Nexium for nine years. Barbara Boucher says she was also Keith Ranieri's girlfriend. But she left in 2009, long before the secret society within Nexium was formed. Barbara is going to join me live in a minute. But first, watch this. Barbara Boucher met Keith Ranieri in the spring of 2000 through her therapist and friend, Nancy Salzman. Boucher, a financial planner, says she was going through a divorce and had lost her best friend when Salzman encouraged her to join Nexium's executive success programs, a self-improvement course Salzman had started with Ranieri. It was so life-changing and profound. Keith actually taught more than half of the program because it was new. Within a few months, Boucher says her feelings toward Ranieri grew, as did her connection to Nexium. I'm now very, uh, very much in love with Keith very aligned with the philosophy and uh, really uh, have experienced the changes within me. So I began um, helping Keith and Nancy develop, you know, infrastructure and uh, organizational skills and, you know, sales and marketing material and helping to train people. Boucher says their relationship was not typical. Dating Keith Ranieri did not look like going to dinner or, you know, a weekend at the beach. Keith uh, didn't do those kind of social things. Still, she believed they were in a committed relationship. I drove Keith to all the events. Um, he slept at my house three or four nights a week. People would move if they were sitting on the couch next to him, let me sit next to him. So for all general purposes, my observation of how it looked to the people is I was his soulmate, his companion and his significant girlfriend. Boucher now admits there were red flags that caused her to feel uneasy from other women. I didn't know for a year that there was anybody else he was involved with. And during the nine years, there were 12 women he had dalliances with. To what Boucher says was a pattern of manipulation from those closest to Ranieri. I and other people got to see the glimmers of this dark side of Keith and the abuse within his inner circle that started to trickle down. By 2009, Boucher says she knew she had to get out. I gave it the Girl Scout track. I really did. Barbara joins me now. She also shares her story with the new podcast, Undercover, Escaping Nexium. Barbara, great to meet you. Thank you for being here. So let's just talk about this because we, we talk about these groups so often without spending much time on what would suck you into a group like this? You know, this group now, with the benefit of hindsight, we know would, would ultimately form this secret society, allegedly, where women say they were getting branded and all sorts of things. Right. So what was the attraction initially? So the attraction was the transformational, inspirational uh, curriculum and material. And the people that taught the workshops were really amazing, extraordinary people. And so what would happen is everyday people would go in and take a workshop and it was so life changing that they'd go back to their lives and, you know, their brother would say, oh my gosh, what did you do there? You're like, you know, there's something about you, you know, like my whole staff said, holy cow, we want what you got because there's this aura of peace about you. So that's how it, it fed. Now you wind up becoming Keith Ranieri's girlfriend and we know what was he like because right. the, everyone in the group called him Vanguard. There was like a two-week celebration of the man's birthday. Yes. I mean, at any point where you're like, "This is weird." Yeah. Well, actually, to clarify, um, you know, he was only called Vanguard when he showed up very rarely at the training center within doing a, a, a form. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't his everyday name. You know, it was just in a certain environment. And as far as Vanguard Week is concerned, um, I actually developed and created Vanguard Week, but I did it as an annual conference more so than to celebrate his birthday for 10 days. But, you know, he, what he was like as a person um, is different than what a lot of people saw. He had led a very kind of private, sheltered life, so a lot of people didn't, people like saw him like a movie star and like had, you know, celebrity, like, 
you know, when they were around him. But for me, in everyday life, Keith was a very dynamic person. You know, he was very um, soft-spoken, very uh, engaging in dialogues. He was funny. He was witty. You know, he could play the piano and was very moving. I mean, he, he was very, very... You know, he was a braggart about his alleged resume, which I had the chance yes. to ask his lawyer about. Yeah. You remember this? Mark, Mark Agnifilo, his, his a very good lawyer. He's, he's defending him now because he's in prison yeah. awaiting charges that he denies. This is actually, do we have that sound bite? Because we, we had a spicy exchange on um, Keith Raniere's stories about himself. Here's some of it. Okay. What about Keith Raniere and his tenuous relationship with the truth? He claimed he graduated from high school and started RPI at age 16. That's not true. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know when he started. He claimed he, he could make full sentences by a, the age of one. If, if exaggerating about one's resume is a crime, I think we're all in trouble. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm probably not either, but yeah. other than the two of us? This guy is a liar. He has a long history of lying about himself and his achievements, including his time at RPI, where he was a 2.2 GPA and not a triple major who set records at the school. That doesn't worry me in the least. No? No. <laughs> <laughs> but this, I mean, he did do a lot of sort of puffery, as we refer to it in law, about himself. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that, that he did. Um, you know, a lot of people say to me, well, you know, was he smart and did he do these things? And my response is generally... I don't know how high his IQ was or whether he spoke at the age of two, but what I observed was a very intelligent man who was very skilled at many things and was very well read, very well educated about a lot of topics. And I watched him with, you know, thought leaders and experts from every walk of life, politics and finance and business come in the doors that I, because of my position, was able to sit and observe him interact so he was, a, he, was a, he was a bright man. So I it was believable. Those stories about himself were believable to you, given that he wasn't, yes. he wasn't correct. You know, he was articulate and he yes. sounded exactly. Uh, well, he was smart enough to, to rope in a lot of people into this group and ultimately to be what prosecutors say was the ringleader mm -hmm. of the group, the mastermind of the group that wound up branding women. Um, when we come back, we'll pick it up right there. We're back now with Barbara Boucher, a former member of the controversial self-help group Nexium. Another former member, Sarah Edmondson, exposed an alleged secret society within Nexium when she publicly shared this shocking image of a brand on her own pelvic region last fall. Here she is talking about it. And I was feeling pain and I had all these women around me like holding me and it was like awful and at the same time in those moments like crazy intense to go through this with a bunch of women that I was like starting to feel close to because we're going through trauma together oh my god this is crazy and I'm also like pushing myself just to get through it Think of that. That was Sarah Edmondson from a new investigative series from CBC podcast called Uncover, Escaping Nexium. Josh Block, its host and producer, is also joining us now. Josh, welcome. So, so you know Sarah Edmondson personally. Um, I talked to Bernieri's lawyer, again, the guy who we just showed, Mark Agnifilo, and he was like, you know what, Sarah Edmondson, she did that voluntarily. We'll be able to prove in a court of law that that was completely voluntary, that these women were empowered. And this is, if they want to brand themselves, just like if you want to get a tattoo, it's up to you. There's nothing unlawful about it. What would she say to that? She would say that she proceeded with that branding ceremony after handing over collateral, which was damaging collateral that would have destroyed her life if, if it was released. It was nude photos, it was false confessions about loved ones, and that she says she did not know what, both that it was going to be a brand or that it was going to be the initials of the leader, Keith Raniere, mm -hmm. that it was a KR. In fact, she only found out, she says, that that's what was on her body two months after being branded. And that's what started the process of, for her of waking up and saying, what am I a part of? I need to get out of this thing. Did she know that she was joining a sex slave group? No. No, what she was, it was pitched to her, and this is 12 years into this group, this is her life. She's approached by a group of, by, by people that are close to her, saying, be a part of this women's empowerment group to take your personal growth to the next level. It's all women, we're coming together, and we're going to really achieve the goals we want to achieve. And 
she thought that that's, you know, when she handed over, she did willingly hand over collateral to join it, but that was part of her commitment to it. She didn't know what she says she found out later, which was that Keith Raniere was actually a part of this. And she said she learned later that women in the group were being instructed to have sexual encounters with Keith. And when you were with Keith as his girlfriend, thinking that it was monogamous, you said in the piece you wind up finding out he had 12 other lovers at the same time, was, I mean, what was that reveal like? Did you, did you, was it like, oh, my God, he's sleeping with everybody in this group? Or was it like, oh, he's just a prolific cheater? Right. That's, that's a really good question. I'm asked this a lot. So um, I thought I was the only one in his soulmate for about a good year. I didn't know about anybody. And then after a year, I found out about someone that they then portrayed was, was gay and just a student teacher kind of thing a couple times a year. And so they framed things. In my nine years there... Um, I only knew about a few of them. They all knew about each other, and there was 12 of them, and not consecutively and continually, but certain periods of time. And I didn't find out about nine of them until after I left. So they had a very carefully crafted conspiracy to withhold this from me because Keith knew that if I knew that, I wouldn't have stayed. Mm -hmm. And I was integral in helping create the company and you know, putting systems in, and plus he loved me, allegedly, you know, mm -hmm. so I didn't know about all of those women, and I couldn't tell, mm -hmm. and like I said, if I walked in the room, you know, everybody made way for me, like it would be normal that I was his girlfriend. I asked his lawyer about the allegations that he was sleeping with, you know, big numbers of women within the group, and he said it's a far more limited number sure. than uh, is being alleged, and that, you know, he's a, he's a vibrant man who... A big fan of female sex, and you know, we'll go on from there. We're back now with Barbara Boucher, once a high ranking member of Nexium, who says she also dated its founder, Keith Raniere, along with Josh Block, the host and producer of Uncover Escaping Nexium from CBC Podcasts. So, can I ask you, Josh, about Sarah and the brand? You've seen it? I have. I have. And it was shocking to see. I mean, I saw it first when she was on the front page of the New York Times, which was itself just the most stunning thing to see someone you grew up with suddenly, you know, there on the front page showing this brand on her body. When I did the interview with her, she did show me it as well, and it was still healing. So some lines of it were now just, you know, thin scars, and some were red and swollen, um, but it is... One of those things where some scars you can see and some you cannot. And she is somebody who extricated herself from the group, which has not always been that easy. Even when you left in 2009, there were attempts made to come get you, like get her, get her back here, right? Right. This is before DOS and all this That's alleged right. sex slavery mm -hmm. and so on. Do you, and what do you make of these allegations that, you know, he, they went on to form this secret society, it was DOS, they were alleged sex slaves, they were branding themselves, it was, Keith was the mastermind behind, do you believe that? Yeah, so I, I mean, I have a theory about why he formed DOS. Um, when I left, I was the first, I was the highest ranking person to ever leave and a significant person, and that really threw a curveball and opened up Pandora's box. But uh, another, one of his closest girlfriends in confidence who oversaw the lawsuits left four years ago. And when she left, she started working with the authorities with what she knew about the corruption side of it. That, I think, completely unglued him because here was his most devoted, knowing the most, who left and tossed him under the bus. And it's interesting that a year later he formed this women's group. And so I believe, and he formed it beginning with his inner closest women. And I believe that he did that in an, in an effort to begin to tighten the hatch down, to try to have them police each other and try to keep information contained, hence the collateral to keep them from talking. But I think, you know, Keith, Keith was a deeply flawed human being. And I think one of his fatal flaws was going beyond his inner circle of women to bring in women he had no intimate relationship with, like Sarah Edmondson, mm -hmm. and bringing them into the fold when they're like, this what is, is this? bizarre. Well, and it's like one thing if you think you're joining something for female empowerment and to make yourself, you know, be more self-reliant, and then the next thing you know, you're getting branded without anesthesia. Right. With a, with a cauterizing tool. I mean, that, right. that can jolt you right out of, right. you know, a disbelief. He's in jail right now awaiting trial on multiple felonies and so is Allison Mack the former star of Smallville who got recruited into the group and was said to be his right-hand woman and along with others um, what do you think Josh what's the what's the conventional wisdom about how that trial's gonna go 
It's hard to see. I mean, we've seen some evidence that the FBI has put forward in their indictment, and it seems quite damning on the one hand. You have uh, email exchanges between Keith Raniere and, uh, you know, alleged DOS members talking about his role in it. But it's, it's hard to tell. We also spoke with, with Mark Agnifilo, and it seems like they're going to be mounting, you know, he's very confident. He's gonna, be, Mark's going to go, go yeah. after it. And yeah. he gave us a statement saying, Keith and I feel very strong uh, in our position, both legally and factually. We look forward to the day when people with something to say about Keith do so in a courtroom and subject themselves to cross-examination in public. We will continue to follow it. Thank you both so much. Thank you. We'll be right back.